first half of the fourth reading, we talk about the division of the priests, the way the Kohanim would assume positions in the Beis Amigdash over a period of different times during the year. And in the second half of the fourth reading of Pasha Shevtim, we talk about the concept of divination versus the notion of prophecy. And we end with a call for wholehearted sincerity, as you will see. So, we're going to pick it up. Chapter 18, verse 9. You are coming to this land. Now, this land of Canaan was not a place where godliness or monotheism was very popular. In fact, quite the contrary. It was a land that God has given you, but the people living in this geography prior were not following the approach of Torah at all. And Hashem says, I'm bringing you to this land, but lo silmad la'asos evos ha'goyim ha'heim. Do not learn to follow or imitate the abomination of those nations. What was the abomination of the nations? So Rashi explains, lo silmad la'asos. This means you're not allowed to learn in order to follow through with action and do. Aval atalomed, you can learn so that you understand what exactly you're dealing with. Now, why do you need to understand what you're dealing with? It says Rashi Kalimar, in other words, to understand their depraved behavior. How twisted, how perverse, how depraved it is. And therefore, to teach your children, you see what people are doing. Don't do such and such. That, who, that is, Chok Hagoyim. That's the statute of the nations. That's not what we follow. So, in other words, you don't have to be oblivious to your surroundings. You can learn what they do. You can be aware of what they do, as long as it's not like so many lasses. As long as you're not learning this in order to be able to do it. As long as you're learning to be able to know what not to do. To be able to show your children, here's what they do, it's not what we do. So this is the kind of behavior you have to avoid. The Cheskuni says that prior to this second half of the fourth reading, we have learned about people we're supposed to listen to, people we're supposed to get direction from, like the Ecclesiastical Court of the Jewish people, the High Court, the Sanhedrin, like the monarchy, which is supposed to be unadulterated by corruption and supposed to remain loyal to Torah, like the Kohanim, who have the sacred duty of representing us in the Beis Amigdash and being our spiritual teachers and mentors. And up until now, we're told about who we should be listening to. And from here onward, Hashem tells us who we should not listen to. In fact, who it's prohibited to listen to. They will try to teach you. They will try to impress upon you their ways. Don't listen. You're not supposed to learn from this. The Tzler Hamar says that we learned about the establishment of a monarchy. And the monarchy, oftentimes, in other nations and other cultures, would lean on the occult in order to find information or to gain some kind of spiritual validity. And we're being told, no, 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 this is not for you. You have a whole different set of rules that you have to live by. Rabbeinu Bechaya says, don't learn it to do. In addition to what Rashi says, Rabbeinu Bechaya adds that the judges of the Sanhedrin would have to learn all about this. Why? Because if they had to deal with a case of somebody who had engaged in this practice, how would they know if the person was guilty or not if they don't have a clue? They never learned anything about it. <clears throat> so there are times that you have to learn about it. But you're allowed to learn about it in order to know what not to do. You're allowed to learn about it in order to know how to deal with it. But never to be able, chas v'shalom, to actually go ahead and follow this behavior. This should never be amongst you. A person who passes his sons or daughter through the fire. A person who is a stick diviner. As we're going to hear about that soon. That's a diviner of auspicious times according to Rashi. A menachesh and a mechashif. Which are uh, respectively an illusionist or a diviner who interprets 
all kinds of omens or uses sorcery. Let's take a look at Rashi and he will explain to us of what we speak. Mavir b'no yobite be'esh, the one who passes his sons and daughters through the fire, which is a central feature in the cult worship of a pagan god called Molech. Says Rashi, he avodas ha Molech. This is the service of the Molech. In Avodah Zarah, which is mentioned <coughs> in the Torah, it's mentioned in the book of Leviticus, as it says, There it says it clearly. But here we just say, And how did they behave? What did they do? What was the way of worship? They'd make two enormous fires, and then they would take the child, and they would pass the child between the fire. So it sounds like burning the children, and they were lunatics and depraved individuals who did that too. There are still people doing that, living in the area that we call Eretz Yisrael. They just blow the children up and then give out candies and sing and dance about it. So, but this, these people, Molech people, did not actually kill their children. Maybe they wanted to kill your children. They didn't kill their own children. What they would do is they would pass their children through this fire symbolically as if maybe they would dangle their, their legs through the fire or pass them through two fires. And the point was that they were giving them over to the worship, to the service, to the loyalty and dedication to this occult. So to this is this a literal fire? Yeah, oh yeah, <coughs> definitely a literal fire, but you know, at least the way Rashi explains it, they didn't actually burn the children. <coughs> the way Ramam explains it also, they didn't burn the children. They would pass the children through the fire. What is a Kosim Ksamim? That's the next fellow here. This is the uh, diviner, stick diviner, the diviner. What does it mean? Rashi says, good question. I have the same question, Rashi says, Ezehu Kosim. What is a Kosim? And after introducing the question, which is unusual, Rashi usually just gives us commentary. Here he actually begins with the question, what is this person? What does he do? So he says, Ha'oiches makloi. he holds his staff, Ve'oimer, Im Eilech, Im So it's like a Ouija board, which by the way, I have no idea what that is, but whatever, he holds a stick like this, and this, and this, should go, shouldn't go. I don't know what it is, but uh, he's using mechanism and he's using different kinds of instruments to be able to divine the future or make decisions. And similarly, this is what the prophet says to us in Harsh Rebuke. Ami be'etzai yisho. My nation has now turned or resorted to asking wood for advice. And his staff tells him. So this was the kind of instrument or mechanism that they used in those days. Today it would be anything from a crystal ball to tarot cards. And again, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about, but different kinds of things, which people use in order to be able to supposedly divine the future and tell you what you should do or what you shouldn't do. So this is all a direct violation of the Torah. What's a ma'onen? A ma'onen is a person who's a diviner of auspicious times. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva says, Rashi tells us, these are the people who give a fixed times. Sha'imrim, they say, this is the right time. Horoscope. This is the right time for you to begin a business. The Chacham say, no, that's not what a Ma'onin is. A Ma'onin is illusionist. Not to be confused with today's entertainers who don't try to tell you that they actually are divine and are doing real magic, if you will. This, they, 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 you know that they're an illusionist. They know they're an illusionist. Nobody can figure out how to do it. And actually, it's pretty amazing some of the stuff they do. But nobody actually worships these people. But once upon a time, these illusionists use these tricks in order to get people to follow them and to do all kinds of idolatrous things. So that's when it's a direct violation of the Torah. Menachesh. Who is the Menachesh? The Menachesh is the diviner who interprets omens. <coughs> Rashi says a Menachesh is pitoy noflo piv. Maybe a piece of bread falls out of his mouth during mealtime. And he says, oh, bad, bad sign. Tzvi hifsike bederech. There's a deer that crosses his path. And he says, uh-oh, I can't go in this way anymore. A deer ran across it. Makle nofl miyode. His walking stick or staff fell out of his hand. And so he says, oh, this means A, B, C, or D. This is not different from in today's day and age. People saying, a black cat crossed my path. Or we won't have a 13th floor. 
or some other mumbo jumbo like that, as if assuming that there's a power and, and some kind of potency that's attached to the occult, to divination, and to various fears and concerns and anxieties that people have of these, these kinds of forces. The Torah goes on to list more. V'choy ver This is the snake or scorpion diviner. It's going to get even more weird. And then we have the shoyal oiv and the yid oni. The shoyal oiv is the person who has voices coming out of his armpit. And that's because he props up a human corpse under it. And the yid oni is the diviner who speaks from his mouth by placing the bone of an animal called Yodoni in his mouth and then he starts clacking and speaking in tongues or something. Or, finally, there's the Dora Shel HaMesim. This is the person who seeks to communicate with the dead. Rashi says, Chover Chover. The word Chover Chover comes to the terminology of Chaver, which means a friend. Or Lehit Chaver means to connect, to unite. So Chover Chover is a mitzar if this person puts together nechashim or akravim, snakes or scorpions, or echad, or other animals into one place, and he becomes a snake diviner, snake charmer, and he uses this collection of these these poisonous snakes, these dangerous serpents and scorpions, in order to achieve some kind of mastery or demonstrate some kind of power that he makes you want to believe that he has abilities, otherworldly abilities. Shoel Ov, who is the Ov questioner? Rashi says, there, This is a kind of witchcraft, or wizardry, which is known as Piton. The person has voices coming out of his armpit. I told you it's going to be weird. Umayla es hameis mi beis shechi shaloi. He kind of props up a corpse under his underarms. Yeah, pretty sick. The Yedoni. The Yedoni is machnes etzem of a chai. Chaya. Uh, he puts the bone of an animal, sheshma, yadua, and he puts it to take piv in his mouth. Umedaber ha etzem. And it says, if this bone starts to talk on itself. A Yedei Mechashves. And that once again happens to the powers of witchcraft. V'deda shalamesim. What does it mean? Somebody who seeks out the counsel of the dead. Kigoyin hamayla bizachrusei or bizichurei. Like a person who literally fornicates with the dead, or maybe kind of does different things to steep himself in the, the culture of the dead, of you know of ghosts and goblins and, and all that kind of stuff, in order to connect to the dead. Also, Ra- Rambam tells us that this is a person who stars himself to the point where he's like in a faint, and he sleeps in the cemetery, and, and, and engages with bones and, and things like this. As Vashi says here, Hanishal Bigogailus, the person who's got a human skull, and he's trying to communicate with the human skull. Okay, roundup. The roundup is Ki Soyavas Hashem Kol Eisa All of these things are abominable in God's eyes. Ubiglal Hato Evota Eila, and it was precisely because of these abominations, Hashem Alekecha Meirishesem Mipanecha, that God empties or disgorges and drives these people out of the land before you. Rashi says, Oise kol elo neemer. It doesn't say you have to do all these things. Ela oise kol elo. Do any of these things. Kol mi asha. If you do a filo achas mehem. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to go through the whole list, the whole litany. You do even one of these things. Or it's already abominable. And this is the behavior that caused us to be, to our, the people who were in the land before us to be driven out. And chas v'shalom. If we behave this way, it causes us for similar things to happen as well. So what should we do? Tomim tiyeh Hashem alikecha. You should be Tomim with Hashem your God. What is Tomim? <clears throat> Rashi says that this word Tomim means his imoi betimimus. Walk with God with sincerity. Betitzapalai. Look to God for a bright future. Don't obsess over trying to figure out the future, or using all kinds of mechanisms or shamans to be able to divine what tomorrow will bring. Walk with Hashem. Follow Hashem's Torah. Do what Hashem wants. Be wholehearted and sincere. <clears throat> Don't obsess over these things. Va'az, and then, if you'll be a tamim, tiye, then you'll be imoy ulechelchay. Then you'll be with God. So that's, that's the way. You want to be with God? 
That's the way you can be with God. Now this is really odd because when we take a look in the other Mepharshim who speak about Tomim Tia in Hashem Alekecha, how do they interpret the word Tomim? Unculus, for example, says to you that Tomim means <coughs> Shalim. What does Shalim mean? It's Aramaic. It's like the word Shalom in Hebrew. What does it mean? Whole. Perfect. Be intact with God. Be whole with God. Ramban, so Gezunt, Ramban speaks about this and he says that we should be Shalimim B'Yiris Hashem. We should be perfect in our reverence and our awe for Hashem. And therefore, we shouldn't be concerned with what this one will say or the other one will say. These diviners mean nothing to us. We're wholehearted or, more accurately, perfect in our reverence for Hashem. And because our reverence for Hashem is impeccable and perfect, so therefore, we don't have to be concerned with any of these diviners or charmers or wizards and so on and so forth. But Rashi says, no, no, no. Tamim doesn't mean whole. Tamim means sincere. His halachi moi betimimus means walk with sincerity with God. And this has to be understood. Why did Rashi choose the seemingly non-literal interpretation of the word tamim, ignoring Unculus, even though usually Unculus is Rashi's primary guide? He doesn't follow Unculus's approach. Ramban does, and many others do. And Rashi insists that here tamim does not mean perfect or whole in a literal way, but rather it means sincere. So, to understand this better, we're going to take a look now in the Buram book. And the Rebbe asks precisely this question on page Reish Chafei, Simon Hay, this is the fifth entry of Pasha Shoftim. The Rebbe says, Yesh Lishal, we could ask. And here, the Rebbe augments the question. Hamusag Tomim Moifia Kvar Bekosov Bemekoimais Koidmim. The word Tomim has already appeared. It's not the first time it appears. Now, Rashi has a rule. If there's a word that he explained once, he will not explain it again. This, Rashi's not here to repeat himself. If you have a bad memory, then you have a problem. You have an issue, figure it out, work on it. If he said it once, he expects you to know it, not only for that verse, but for posterity. You, get the, you got the message, I explained this word to you, you know what the word means, you're good to go. If it's a word everybody knows, he doesn't have to explain it at all. So the word Tomim shows up already. We have the word Tomim. In fact, it appears very early on in the Torah, in the second portion of the entire book of Torah, in the first book of Genesis. It speaks about a righteous man whose name was Noach. And it says, Noach ish tzaddik. Noach was a righteous man. Tamim haya bedorotov. You don't have to wait long. A portion later, we have Hashem telling another very righteous man, that he should be a Tomim. And this is Abraham Avinu. In the end of Parshas Lech Lecha, it says, His Halech Lefanai, I want you to walk before me, or serve me, Veheye, and you should be Tomim. You should be whole. You should be perfect. And how does Rashi explain the word Tomim in both Parshas Nayach and Parshas Lech Lecha? He says it means whole. Because it means perfect. Noach was Tomim. He was perfect in his reverence for Hashem. Noach didn't do anything wrong. He actually had a perfect scorecard. So why was Noach seen as somewhat deficient? Because he didn't influence anybody else in a positive way. But he himself was perfect. He was perfectly orthodox. He had the perfect checklist. Everything you were supposed to do, Noach did. Except make a difference in the world. But that does not in the checklist. As far as Noah's own personal life was concerned, perfect. Tell him. And Rashi leaves it at that. He doesn't say Noah was a sincere person. He doesn't say Noah was wholehearted. God says to Avraham Avinu, I want you to be perfect. Well, as long as you still have the Arla, you have the foreskin, you're not perfect. I need you to be intact. I need you to be perfect. And the way you're going to be perfect is by removing that which is toxic, that which is negative. So Avraham Avinu removes something and then he becomes a perfect specimen. So that's perfection again. And Rashi leaves it at that. <clears throat> Rashi doesn't come along and say, no, 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 it doesn't mean whole, it doesn't mean perfect, it means wholesome, it means sincere. So if Rashi didn't feel a need to change the meaning in Parshas Noach, and he didn't feel a need to change the meaning in Parshas Lech Lecha, 
then why in Pasha Shoftim did he suddenly decide that Tumim cannot mean what it sounds like? It cannot sound, it sounds like whole. No, can't mean that. It has to mean sincere, which of course etymologically is related to wholeheartedness and wholehearted sincerity, but, but sincerity is not whole sincerity, it's sincerity. Sincerity is, is, comes from, you know, a, almost like a, a, simp, a simplicity in our service to Hashem. <clears throat> so the Rebbe explains. Peter Shamila Tamim, the meaning of the word Tamim in the other locations that we mentioned in Parshish, for example, Noach and Lech Lecha, is Shalim. It's whole. Just like we have in the book of Leviticus, numerous times where we hear that the offerings have to be Tamim. It says Se Tamim, a perfect you, a perfect sheep. And that means that the animal is a perfect specimen, that it's not a blemished or damaged animal. It's not an animal who's missing a limb. It's not an animal who has sustained injuries. Vehemetairis, here would then be a description not of an offering, not of an animal. So maybe it's not of physical perfection, but it will be Adam HaMashal HaKadosh Baruch a person who is perfect in his or her commitment. Perfectly committed, which means doing everything he's supposed to do. Perfect. So this employee, perfect employee, does everything he's supposed to do. Okay, they got a perfect scorecard. Well, here Rashi doesn't do that. And the Rebbe says the reason is because here it actually doesn't fit in Pshut Yishol Mikra. Listen to this. Ha-pasik tamim im Hashem The verse here, which is verse 13, shows up as a hem shech lupsukim ha It comes as a continuation of the previous verses. And what do the previous verses speak of? Bahem ma'ifia rashima shal isurim. In them, there's a list of abominable practices. Here's the worst practices of Canaan, the things you shouldn't do. There should be none amongst you who bring their children to the fire. There should be none amongst you who are dead shalomesim, who seek out to communicate with the dead. The point is, the intimation of these verses is, do not violate these specific infractions. Do not violate these specific instructions. Ella, rather, lech, you should walk and go, you should follow the opposite path. What's the opposite of seeking to communicate with the dead? What's the opposite of passing your children through the fires of some occult worship? The answer is tam tia v'shem You should be tam v'shem alikah. So the Rebbe says, das. It's not acceptable then that Tumim here means to be perfect in your Avedis Hashem. Meaning Adam HaMasr LaKadosh Baruch a person who's committed, dedicated, devoted to God. Mekayim is kol mitzvahs of Bishleimahs. He keeps all the mitzvahs. Shari Aksuvim Kan Aiskim Behimanes Mikvutza Mugderes Shali Surim. Here it doesn't say, don't do all the bad stuff. Don't violate the 365 commandments. It doesn't speak about a hair who you shouldn't marry, and it doesn't speak about a hair what you shouldn't eat, and it doesn't speak about a hair the work you shouldn't do. What does it speak about? It speaks about a specific kind of infraction. And the unique dimension of Averot, of prohibitions we speak of, are all related to divination. All related to using all kinds of alien methodologies of spirituality to be able to gain insight into the future or what's the effective way to live. That's what these Averis are about. They're not broad, general Averis that say, don't violate Hashem's Torah. <coughs> Be a good Jew. Follow the instructions Hashem gave you. And because we speak about specific sins here, it doesn't make sense to come back with a rejoinder, don't do A, B, C, and D. Instead, be perfect with God. Be perfect with God would mean if we would have a whole slew of different kinds of prohibitions. If God would say, do not worship idols, and do not work on Shabbat, and, and make sure you don't eat food which is not kosher, and by the way, you're not allowed to marry such and such, and give you a whole bunch of different behaviors, so, so what should you do? Tum him! Tum him! You should be perfect! Don't ruin your scorecard! Do everything right! Then Tum him would mean perfect. But here Tum him comes after a very specific litany of prohibitions, all of which are related to sorcery the use of artificial means to gain insight into what the future portends. And therefore, Rashi says, Tamim Khan can't mean shalom. It can't mean whole. It can't mean perfect. What must it mean? 
It means sincerity. It means that you should go with God simple-heartedly. Whatever God will send my way, I will accept to the best of my ability and continue to serve Hashem without questioning God, without questioning the future, without questioning whether there is validity in alien forms of spirituality, whether there is some kind of integrity that can be found or located in these alien forms of occult practice. That's the point. Don't do those things. Instead, <coughs> be sincere, simple-hearted, and wholehearted with God. Because of Retzef Apsukim, because of the cadence of these verses, which chase one after the other, like domino effect, one, is, one continues in, in, in quick succession, that's why Rashi feels compelled here to explain Tamim not as perfect, but rather as sincere and wholehearted. Let's be wholehearted. Serve Hashem right. So why does the Torah use 